Welcome to this video everyone. This video is for Henry Gibson's A Doll's House and I'm going to be looking at key quotes and passages from Act 3 and this video is mainly for students that are studying the play as part of their A-level. The aim of this video is very simple, to give you a handful of key passages to analyse and annotate them in terms of discussing why they are significant and how an audience could interpret these uh, references. Remember, if you are completing a doll's house and it's being assessed with an open book exam, that gives you the opportunity to have the text in front of you and to be able to use these passages in your exam and to quote quite liberally and also zoom into particular moments of the plot which are relevant to the question. Also a reminder that because this is a play in translation, the language will be different based on the version that you use. So with each publisher, the language is different. And for this video, I'm going to be using this black version, which is from the Penguin Classics edition. So if you're using a different edition, the plot will obviously be the same. Um, the meanings on the whole will be the same, but individual words might be different. And of course, for English literature, when you are commenting on language, it's always useful that students have the same um, text in class, as well as the same text in class that they will have in the exam. So all about Act 3, let's talk about the end of the Act first. Let's talk about really the climax of the whole play, which is the um, catalyst and, and the kind of the emphasis placed on the letter and how that letter creates the end of their marriage at least in its current form. Uh, Nora, of course, makes it very clear in Act 3 why the play is called the way it is. Clearly, the word doll is a metaphor for her in the microcosm, but also for women in general in the macrocosm. And of course, here she says to Torvald, I have been performing tricks for you. So that the idea that she is performing in the same way that a puppet would perform or a doll would perform. And she then goes even further and challenges patriarchal control. She basically blames Halma and her dad, Papa, for being the ones that have caused her great um, strife in her life and never making anything of herself. And of course, that word nothing is quite strong here because clearly she has had an eight year marriage and she has got three children. So for some women, that would be achieving something. But of course, she is separating herself completely from that role of being the wife and mother first and foremost. So at this point, of course, her language, her tone, her register is direct and it's uncompromising, which is at odds with the style of speech that she had in the beginning of the play when she spoke in a very childlike way, which now clearly is not her natural way of talking. That's clearly an act that she was putting on in the beginning because she thought that's what she did as a wife. That's what she thought women do. They, they create this role. Um, again, continuing in that same part of the play, shortly after Halma has read Krogstad's letter and it all becomes clear about the loan and the deception and the forgery, uh, this is clearly the climax of the play. Um, Halma says that, you know, they should forget marriage, they should, well, they should forget happiness. Um, now it's just about trying to save the wreckage. So the noun wreckage, of course, has connotations of something that's been destroyed, suggesting that their marriage now has gone past the point of being saved. They will probably live together to, to maintain the artifice of respectability uh, because of the sanctity of marriage and the importance of, from a societal point of view, from an outsider's view, keeping the impression of a happy marriage, but actually it's a wreckage behind the scenes. Notice as well that this is all about um, from his perspective. So from his perspective, the marriage is wreckage. And it goes to show, of course, that he completely overlooks the main reason why she took this loan out in the first place, which was in fact to save his life or at least to make his health better. Uh, he seems to completely forget the motivation for this and goes straight to a tyrannical force, which is punitively punishing his wife um, for actually... Uh, sacrificing her own innocence, you could say, uh, for him. And of course, appearance is very much to do with the title and to do with facades. Just because the doll's house and the room might be comfortably middle class doesn't necessarily mean the characters and the marriage in that home is happy. Of course, this house um, is full of secrets and lies, which we have seen throughout the whole of the play. And it's only when you open the cover of that house do you see the reality inside. 
So in other words, you can look at a house in the street and the house might have an immaculate garden, but you don't know what's going inside that house until you go inside. And of course, in this play, we're almost like a fly on the wall um, in this marriage with this couple. Um, one of the key passages, no surprise, is the passage where Nora kind of honestly says in an un uncompromising way that I am a doll, effectively, and therefore you have um, this cyclical problem which has been passed down cross-generationally. It also links very clearly to the title, and there has already been a question about the title of the play from about four years ago. So the title can often be a source of um, significance in terms of meaning. What's also important here, of course, is that she calls the house a playroom, and that has childlike connotations. Um, and a doll's house is, of course, usually found in the playroom. So it's almost as if they've been playing house, or she believes that for the last eight years they've been playing house. It has not been a proper grown-up marriage or relationship. Of course, she begins this kind of um, duologue, this kind of dialogue between two characters, with the question um, about, isn't you know, doesn't it strike you as odd that this is the first time that we've spoken honestly in eight years? Isn't it odd that this is the first time we've had an adult conversation in this house? So again, of course, her language, her tone here is again at odds with how she spoke at the beginning of the play in that kind of childlike register. Um, of course, this is not a play about an actual doll's house, but a metaphorical doll's house, uh, which is where they're living. And of course, Nora is the doll to be played with um, and to be dressed up in this house. Um, I've already analysed this in a video a couple of years ago, where I, oh, actually I think it might have been last year. But anyway, I've already done a video about this passage, really looking at the linguistics of this um, of this dialogue here, uh, in which sacred duties are mentioned. So again, it's included in that video. But for the purposes of this video, again, that word sacred, almost having religious connotations, uh, as if from Halmer's perspective, he believes that a woman is about uh, looking after the husband and children. And therefore, this is that beha um, Nora's behaviour is really testing and dissenting from this almost theocratical belief that this is how society is. So it's almost heretic, almost, from Halmer's perspective, that Nora even dare um, dispute the fact that him and the children are not actually her most sacred duties. Um, and of course, you've got that phrase then, Blue, before all else, you are wife and mother, in brackets, in my opinion. So, of course, that's his view. And in this kind of patriarchal society where men, of course, had the control of the marriage, um, that is just repeating what a lot of men at the time would have thought. And to have a, to have a woman uh, honestly and uncompromisingly being honest and saying, actually, no, before all else, I'm a human being. And then by walking out of that marriage in that house, effectively separating and rejecting that societal uh, obligation, again, Nora's behaviour is almost heretical. And that's what obviously made the play very controversial when it was first published and first performed, so much so that Ibsen was forced to write a second ending where, of course, how, uh, where Nora stayed. And of course, we study the actual ending, which is where she leaves. Ibsen said himself, a woman cannot be herself in modern society. So clearly, this is a feminist text. So this declarative sentence, before all else, you are a wife and mother, from Halmer's perspective, shows that uh, women at this time are being oppressed and marginalised because of their marital role. So marriage is equal to a sense of female sacrifice here. And clearly, Ibsen is using Nora as a device to... Um, to um, protest against that um, and um, creating kind of a reality here, trying to um, promote some kind of egalitarian sense of equality, that actually men and women are the same, uh, testing this idea that men and women are in completely separate spheres, the men being in business and financial world and um, the women being in the kind of motherly household world. So it's that pursuit of being a new woman breaking away from that binary approach. Um, 
again in green here this is something that Nora is called many times in this play it's obviously very patronizing she's compared to a child in this simile actually she's speaking with great wisdom and she's speaking with conviction and an audience might like her more now than they did in the beginning when she was kind of speaking with this kind of pathetic childlike uh, register so she is rejecting that kind of um, patronization i i imagine that's a word um i don't know but the spell check didn't come up as as being wrong so i've left it um but she's fed up of being patronized and this whole conversation at the end of act three is all about her asserting herself and saying i'm not a child um yes okay i don't understand about society but I'm not going to understand it either if I stay in this house with you. So if you want to be, if you want me to be a better person, if you want me to be, um, you know, a bit more full of wisdom, I'm going to have to leave. And that's what she does. Um, of course, by leaving, she is also rejecting religious and legal um, kind of um, obligations and, and expectations as well. He tries to use religion and the law to keep her in there and uh, she doesn't. So she rejects that hence the heretical kind of interpretation. She says that, you know, it's society or me. So it's this idea of the individual versus society. She's almost challenging society here by um, effectively choosing to become um, ostracised from the house. Of course, every time that Nora makes a good point, Halma goes back into this kind of you're ill, you're feverish, you, you're out of your mind kind of approach, which means that he isn't actually listening. And that's the problem. He's making it worse. The hole is being dug deeper. He doesn't say, oh, I understand. You're right. Um, you know, um, I agree with you. He's actually dismissing her. And again, that's part of the problem when actually she's making a valid point. And of course, the staging here, we've got two characters on stage. There's nowhere to hide. In a lot of productions by this point, uh, it is just a spotlight on the two of them on stage. Um, and in some productions, in fact, by the time they get to Act 3, the um, director has made, a decision, has made a decision to get rid of all the furniture on stage as well, just leaving two chairs on stage. So it's very stark staging sometimes, which of course foregrounds their conversation. There's nothing else to distract the audience with other than these two characters going through this major change in their marriage and how they view each other. Um, of course, the, the, this, this um, passage here finishes with a declarative, I've never been so clear and sure suggesting that she is speaking without any doubt at all. She's speaking resolutely uh, and she's speaking empowered in an empowered way, which is in contrast to how she spoke at the beginning. Gone is the childlike desire to get pocket money from him. Um, in comes this empowered woman who is speaking with wisdom and with um, kind of conviction. Of course, we can call her decision to leave um, and an agnoresis, meaning an epiphany, her epiphany is to leave. And by leaving, she is democratically emancipating herself from the house, which is not just a rejection of Halma, but also a rejection of the macrocosm, the society more generally. And that verb slammed is, of course, suggesting force and anger. She doesn't just shut the door gen gently, uh, shut the door gently, um, she slams it, meaning that she's again resolute. She's definite in what she's doing. She has conviction. And the critics have said, of course, that that door, that the sound of that door reverberates around the world, um, leaving a very sullen, silent stage behind where Helmut is just depicted as sinking into the chair, um, effectively making him the doll in the house at the end. Of course, what is a doll's house without a doll in it? So again, is this house now empty? because Nora is no longer in there. The final word that she says is goodbye, and that's particularly blunt and short, lacking in any kind of emotional commitment. Of course, by this point, she says, I don't love you anymore. Here's your ring back. Give me mine. Don't talk to me again. Don't send me a letter. All of these kind of, I've had it, leave me alone. And that's not exactly the language of somebody that's been married for eight years or, and has had three children. Even today, when a couple separates or divorces and they've had children, of course, each parent has the right to see the children still. 
um, because they're each 50% of those kids. So even today in a separation, there are many, many couples that will still see each other after the divorce is finalised because they have to, to stay in contact with the children um, and for the children's sake. But in this case, Nora seems to be suggesting that I'm going to have nothing more to do with you or the children at all. And that, of course, makes audiences a bit split with Nora, particularly today. Some audience members would champion her kind of her spirit, uh, her empowered fashion and say, good for you. Uh, well done for breaking free. Other audiences would say, well, she's still a woman and she's still living in a society that is going to marginalise her. So what difference does it make that she's left? And some audiences would say she's a bad mother because it's not the children's fault that the that um, society is the way it is. It might not even be Halma's fault. He's If you're growing up in a society that says men should act in a certain way, a lot of men are just going to perpetuate that maybe. So Halma perhaps is not a bad man. Um, he just lacks the wisdom to see that there's another way to have a marriage perhaps. So audiences are split. Uh, that links to the question that was asked a few years ago about the ending of texts being ambiguous, uh, the ending of political and social protest texts being ambiguous, which of course this is. We don't know what, that, what happens to Nora once that door slams, and it could be quite interesting to think about what happens afterwards. Some a creative writing activity could be, for example, to get students to write some diary entries after the, fact that she, after the point that she leaves. And I'm sure out there somewhere there must be a play or a novel which is about what happens after she leaves as well as like a sequel to this. Anyway, so those are some quotes some passages from Act 3, some significant passages. And again, the idea would be that you might want to refer to some of those in your answer. Like I said at the beginning, this is an open book exam. So you have got all of this in front of you. And to be able to zoom in to make some comments about dramatic methods, which incorporates language, but also staging. Uh, don't forget to neglect the stage directions as well, because they can also be quite detailed in this play being a prose drama. So um, also look at those. But it's an open book exam for a reason. It's because the examiner wants you to zoom into the language and really get to grips with some of the references to enhance your interpretation of the question. OK, so thank you very much for watching. There are videos, of course, for Act 1 and 2 as well. Um, and uh, happy studies. Good luck. And thank you for watching.